Hi, everybody. Welcome to La Lista, a Latinx writer's podcast. I'm your host, Ruben Mendive. And today we have a brand new guest here, a special guest for our 100th episode. So I like to start every episode by having my guests introduce themselves. So your name and how you identify for the people at home. Uh, Olis, thank you for having me. I'm Tania Saracho. I'm a brown queer storyteller, sort of obsessed with Latinidad. I've got Latinidad on the brain, as messed up as a construct as that is. I've got it on the brain 24-7. Perfect. You'll fit right in. Uh, <laughs> so my follow-up is always, where are you from? So like, what's the short version? What's the long version? What do you tell people when they ask you that? I'm a Mexican national, so I'm I'm still I'm not a citizen. So that's the short, like I'm that's where I'm from, from Mexico. The long version, I'm from Los Mochi, Sinaloa, land of the sea turtles in Sinaloa. Uh, and um, I, we came to McAllen, Texas, where all this stuff is going down right now. Um, well, first we went to Reynosa, Tamaulipas, which was the you know the pueblo fronterizo, um, and then we uh, to to Mac- to McAllen, and then I ended up in McAllen in junior high, high school. And then I went to uh, Boston University. And then I hopped out, you know, when I finished that to study theater, study actuation, acting. And I, I did stumble into writing there a little bit. <clears throat> and then I moved to Chicago, which that's my heart's city. You know, I feel like an adoptive daughter of Chicago. And I so wish I could live there right now. I love the weather. I love all of it. And but that I stayed there 16 years. So like sometimes when people ask me where I'm from. There's like a few places, you know, it's like, um, yeah, I'm Luense, so I was born in Sinaloa, but also there's no design that like my first like landing was Texas. So, so it's Tejanita. like I have a lot of that in my family. All my family now lives in McAllen, um, my immediate family, but like Chicago is my, my, my heart's home. And, but I live in LA now, <laughs> <laughs> like we all do have to do <laughs> You know, I always like to get a family history. So like, what, what is your parents' story? Like grandparents, like, what do you know about where you're, where you come from? Um, I don't know. That's so interesting. I, there's some stuff I've never really uttered. Um, my father disowned me, by the way. So in 2012, so he doesn't speak to me. Um, not because of queerness, because I spoke back to him at a dinner. <laughs> Super patriarchal, like macho, you know, that's that. I, I come from a broken family right now. I'm so just dis, like disconnected from them because of the patriarchs plural you know uh my mom and my my sister still live in um in mccallan and i have another sister that i don't talk to i haven't talked to for eight years also Uh, like it's it's like that it's it's i was embarrassed of this the fact that like i'm i'm a mexican and usually our families are so close-knit so you know it's like and mine is not it's kind of cold and um it's upsetting. It's upsetting that, you know, after, especially after our, all, all my grandparents um, passed in Sinaloa, like in Los Mochis, like I said, where I'm from, we never go back there. Like we, we never, like whatever cousins are left, whatever, like it's a really, um, so I like a good queer have made my family from, you know, chosen friends, um, a chosen family. And that I feel like is really active and, 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 and lovely. I, I, um, when you talk about heritage, you know, uh, my, my mother's family was in, um, Mexico in Sinaloa in that area for a long time. My father's father was born in Bilbao. He was a little bit of an asshole too. Like the men in my family are just have been so problematic. You know, they have lots of different families that when they, you know, cuando se murió, they all came out and it's like, Oh, I have aunts that are younger than, okay. You know, so it's like that kind of situation. My dad was the head of the PRI. I don't know if you're of, of Sinaloa in the 90s. Uh, he was a mayor oficial del PRI. I don't know if it translates to that. Like that, that just gives you the whole picture there. I don't have to say anymore. You know? Um, I never came out to him, but that's because I just didn't say stuff to him. Like I never told him I was diabetic and he read it in a timeout article about me. Um, and I, you know, and he was, he yelled at me. He was like, don't tell. Because he thinks diabetes, I did that. I mm. caused my diabetes from drinking soda and being a fatty, you know, just like your mother's family. They're like, you know, like, you. oh, it's like a poor person's disease. What the, f- like, this man, so he was so embarrassed that I told the press outlet that I was diabetic. It's, uh, this is like his, you know, as a politician, his, like, like, his s- scope, but like, you have to put on a, a, like, a front, you know, which is 
so antithetical, so completely different to who I am. Like I lead with my weaknesses and my flaws and there are more flaws than there are strengths, you know, in me. But that's also why we don't get along and he, um, so family, yeah, that's that. My lovely friends, I went to, um, to London for five months, well, to the UK for five months and, um, and mostly London and my like core family that I adore came uh, during a pandemic. This was just, I mean, I was over there mm. during a pandemic, you know, and they came for the whole month of, of, of December quarantine, but did the whole thing travel this dangerous times where they don't want Americans or, you know, people with American passports. I don't have one of those, but they did. Um, even though they're all Mexican American, um, they, um, went over there and not, like, I am looking at a picture of us right now from this Christmas. And it's like, i all that the love you're supposed to feel all the like connection and all that I feel it from my chosen family and it's whatever in this lifetime I think that's how the family structure is, uh, and dynamic is going to have to work for me yeah. how sad what a sad answer oh my god <laughs> no but I think you know so some people get choose their family and yeah. like and it's complicated you know yeah it's so um, complicated you know you said that you grew up in like McAllen Texas and you know I think there's like the popular narrative of like living on the border and border towns but i don't think actually most people know what it's like to live in a place like that so like how would you describe mccallan to someone that's never been there so mccall i i probably can't describe mccallan now which yeah. is some kind of battlefield and like suburban like uh, town without the herb without the urban area you know it's uh, it's such a weird like it's like a sea of targets now. But when mm -hmm. I grew up there mm -hmm. and when Raul Castillo, my, one of my besties, that an, an actor that uh, is from McAllen, we grew up together. Um, he was on Looking and he was also on Be That and stuff. Anyway, we grew up, we went to high school together, we went to college together. When we grew up there, it was like not as, it didn't feel as suburban, you know? It felt like a border town more. Like, like you had to walk around with two tongues and two minds and two sets of cultural norms, you know? Even though you, it was like hybridity was the norm. And, um, mm. in, when, even when you went down like 10th Street, like the, the ads were like in Spanish and English, even before that was cool, you know, like, and then you can pay with pesos or dollars, wherever. This was before, you know, and there was a lot because it was so boring and, and dead and, and it didn't have a lot of art. Access, like we didn't have a lot of access to art. I think that's why there's a lot of artists that do come from there because of that like we got together and like like so Raul and I we we dated when he was like 14 and like we were like kids and, and until like around 22 we were like we would read plays with each other these dog-eared plays and we were like in the drama club like we we and we both got out and are doing this because we we had e like each other like we we were like um rebelling against this like sort of w seemingly culturally dead like no man's land but it wasn't, you know, it's ripe with, with, I mean, the hybridity, now, you had to sort of get away from, mm. from the Valley. We call it the Valley, the Rio Grande Valley to see like the richness, you know, uh, of, of what it was. But like back then we, it was porous. It was, um, if you could do a good American accent, you didn't have to have your passport, um, or your, your Mika, como le decíamos, Mika, which is like a, a, a border crossing card you know you would just be like american citizen and they would let you through oh my god that is so not what it is now it's so yeah. but it was so like porous we would go <laughs> to go we would call it go to mex we're going to mex this friday and they would let 13 year olds 14 year olds like drink you know and we did that and it was fun and but now it's we uh, con los narcos y todo eso ya no se puede hacer eso so like um i have a half brother my with my, with my dad's new family and you know, he's like 20 something, like his generation, it was when, you know, the dawning of the cartels. And um, I mean, no, we've always had cartels, but the dawning, it's, it's all causal, right? What, why, why the cartels turns towards us for the violence, rather than north. Um, but but when we did turn inward to the country, like that got really dangerous, you know, and for my little brother, so his existence was very different than how I grew up, you know, in that border area. There's a lot of beauty in it. Like there's um there's this piece I want to do, um, Texas Gothic. I know there's a novel now called Mexican Gothic, but there's a thing I've been like trying to develop called Texas Gothic, where it tr like I want to trace 200 years of this area's history because it's it's so rich because you know Texas is has been pure fuckery from the beginning. Like they try to be their own, you know, annexed place and like um. Yeah. Anyway, I, it's, it's so interesting. This part of the world, you know, also because, um, this wasn't the border for the longest time. 
another river was the border, like way up. It was like the, I don't know, the Nacoches or I don't forget what river, you know. Um, I better research all that before I write this thing. I knew, I knew, I know all this. I just have to, you know. So like, it's like borders are such, borders are, are so constructed. They're, you know, they're like, so, so arbitrary. It was like, now this river is a border. Now the, you know. And so by that, by that I, I became a border girl, you know, because of somebody deemed that to be the border. And so, you know, I always like to get a sense of people during high school. So I mm-hmm. frame it in these three questions. Um, and this is like 14 to 18. Who were you? Who were you pretending to be? And how do you think other people saw you? Who was I? Um, I have, first I have to say I'm a Sagittarius, like a like triple Sagittarius. And I was a double Sagittarius. Um, and I can't lie too much so just that that's been me then and now I felt fine in high school I think I was in president of drama club I was in student council I was in choir for a little bit until I quit because my drama stuff was too important you know and I could sing in the musical there anyway you know um I was in journalism so like yearbook and um newspaper and so I was like an ev. I was an ev. because let me tell you when I before coming to the before coming to this country I consumed Americana, so, but in a very specific way. We only had two VHSs. Okay, I'm dating myself. It, it was uh, Grease 2, not Grease 1, Grease 2 with Michelle Pfeiffer. And, but, so it was all old already, but, but um, that's what I would consume. And I was like, oh, that's what an American mm-hmm. high school is like, Grease 2. But that's like from the 60s and also it's a music. I mean, come on, Tanya. But, uh, and then um, Karate Kid Part 2. These were old already, but like, that I was like, oh, okay, the 50s are really in. But like it had already basically my interpret my immigrant interpretation of all these things was like, <laughs> I show up the first day of school and it's like, what what am I wearing? Why am I like I was wearing like a 50s jacket and oh it was really but I didn't I was like completely unaware that I was uncool or if I was uncool. I don't know if I was, you know, I never felt it. Um too much my the only thing was my accent because i spoke you know because i went to like proper mexican schools where they taught you english but i knew how to be like please tell me where the restroom is that kind of stuff not like cool like all the slang you know and that's when you like scream immigrant 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 when you don't know the slang and it wasn't as global as it is now now any mexican kid knows how to the slang because of music and because just global now and the and you know a wifi has changed everything, you know, uh, um, the internet <laughs> for, for those of us who don't know what I'm talking about, Wi-Fi. but, um, back then it was interpretive and, and it was a lot of like haziness around it. So I don't, I thought I was fine. And I see people that thought, meaning like, I didn't feel, um, otherized until I got to college, you know? Um, but not even in that way. Um, I, so I was in all the things I was in drama and all the play, like, I don't know that it was, Oh, also, also. My favorite thing was uh, Raul and I and all the drama kids were in uh, speech and debate. And we would go every weekend to San Antonio, the big city. <laughs> it was like the big city, five hours away. And we would go uh, and compete with, um, you know, interpret uh, like uh, either humorous interpretation, dramatic interpretation, duet interpretation, poetry, um, or prose. Well, I did all those five events um, and um, I won a lot. And I loved that. <laughs> this is my favorite. This sounds, maybe I peaked. I peaked in high school and that's it. Um, but I love getting off because we were like a small town, McAllen, and we showed up and we were competing in San Antonio tournaments or Houston tournaments with like big schools from like, from, from, from the big cities, you know, Dallas and all that. And, um, we would show up and get off the plane. We're like, Oh my God, that's Tanya Saracha from Mac High. Oh my gosh, she's here for, cause I want poetry all the time. I went, cause I was so dramatic and like we, my poem that I picked, um, I think I want state or something. The, the way that this started was um, what I thought that I was trying to change my the accent thing. I hated that we're making fun of my accent. Like, because I would, re- you know, you would read in class and stuff. And I would say stuff like Plymouth instead of Plymouth. But mm. I'm like, it says Plymouth. By r- there are no rules to English. Mm-hmm. Oh, it is the worst fucking language, you know. And um, and that's when I joined uh, in junior high speech and debate. And I thought it I thought it was speech therapy like to get Mm. rid like to get rid of my accent I don't know you know that's what I was interpreting from like the little poster I saw on the join the speech and debate team I didn't understand the debate part I was like oh speech they're gonna change my speech 
I, you know, I, I started and like the first day Mrs. Lewis handed me a Royal Doll poem and she was like, do voices and stuff. And, and without knowing, cause I was a ham in Mexico, I'm going, oh, like a ham in English. And I was like, I started doing the voices of the, it was a uh, Cinderella by Royal Doll. She handed me and it was like, I was the stepmother. I was the diggity, you know, and, and then she was like, okay, give your mom this permission slip and get $20 or something and, and show up at 8 a.m. on Saturday. And, and I was, and my mother was like, yes, so. Yes, okay. The, no sé, mami, pues es para lo de speech. O sea, es para, and, and so my mother, being a good immigrant mother, was like, whatever they say at the school, we do, you know? Here's your 20, kids, $40, <laughs> just in case. And, you know, super signed and whatever, you know? I would start coming back from these, like, my mom would have to pick me up at six, and I would, like, be showing up, kept showing up with, with, with trophies. And she was like, pues, ¿qué estás haciendo, Tania? No, no sé, mami, eh... <laughs> yo declamo en frente de, de tres personas y luego me pasan a otro cuarto, declamo en frente de tres personas y luego en un auditorio declamo y me dan uno de estos. <laughs> like, I have no idea. Like, I, I didn't understand what was happening, but I wasn't speaking. And then, and then I was hooked because by, by the time I got to high school, I was good at it. And I loved that reaction when we would go, you know, five hours away to be like, oh my God. And I was be such a like, like, because you had to have a black, um, like, notebook where all your poems and all your, like, pieces were. And, like, to toda bien bañadita and, like, very, like, like a church dress. Like, that's how, you, you know? And I just would walk, like, such a, like, so proudly. It was, like, the thing I was the proudest of. I don't know. Um, and, yeah, I won a lot of time. We we won, um, this was third place in nationals or something. Cute in El Paso. Like, we went 18-hour bus drive. That's how big Texas is. From one side from the Gulf of Mexico to like El Paso, it was an 18 um, hour bus drive with vampire lesbians of Sodom. We, that was like the thing we did. And I thought I was being so like, oh, that was a little did I know that the, like that term lesbian would be like, <laughs> like the thing, it was like, why are you attracted to this title, Tanya? We now know. Um, but it, um, so I, I was, I don't, I don't know why I use the term popular, but I had access and I was like, you know how they pick the Hall of Fame? Like they pick 12 Hall of Fame senior. I was in the Hall of Fame. Or they pick um in Texas, we have Cotillion, debutante ball, and the the like it's like 12 or 16 girls, something like that. And the country club picks them and they picked me. I was one of the, like few and we weren't even members of the country club because my parents didn't even know enough to be, you know. Now it, they were eh, members of Los Leones and Reynosa, which is like, you know, but not like they had not translated. So I was actually Raul. He was my date and with a big white dress. They told us um, how much the diameter had to be of the dress. Like oh. it was like legit gone with the wind shit, you know? But so like, I don't want to say popular or not popular. I was always in the okay space. You know, I didn't feel otherwise that much. Now, how would people rem um, remember me? Oh, I was also president of the key club, which was like always doing climate change stuff and stuff, but like just basically having beach cleanups, yeah. you know? I wonder if people would think I was just a dra una dramática, maybe, because I was always like, you know, on stage. I don't know. Like, I don't keep like in touch with a lot of high school people, except Raul that I talk to every day. But like, that's because we also went to college together. We worked together on looking and be that. Like, he's like my bestie, you know. But um, otherwise, I don't know. What would they think? And I never felt um, so I'm fat, right? For the listener who doesn't know, I'm like full on morbidly obese, and I always have been. And I never, I never felt that. I felt that from my father, you know, he always like, I have uh, so many sur bariatric surgeries that he made me do. Um, he uh, made me get breast reduction at 15 years old. You're not even finished growing yet. My dad is obsessed with my weight. That I inherit. But like in high school, I felt cute and whatever, even though siempre sido gordita. So like, it's such a weird, it's like at home, la gorda, but like, out there, I'm like, I'm the cutest, you know? So it's such a weird, it's something that now I wish my age that I had like the cute, I feel cute part. Like, cause in my twenties when I was in Chicago, oh my God, woo, I lit that town up. Like I felt, I felt like I did. Like I felt, especially cause Chicago was like the number two fattest town in the country that time that like, I was just normal, you know? Like, and I felt like, oh my God, I'm so attractive here. I feel great. And so like, it, and I don't know, and I moved to LA and oh man, Whew. I feel like I'm two people walking around like, like, you know, in Chicago, I never felt like, oh, so the food in Chicago. Oh, so good here. It's like, I'm so aware of what I put in my mouth and, you know, um, let's talk about Chicago, you know, cause I, I actually grew up in Chicago. So I'm <gasps> from did? there. 
What part? Uh, well, um, I was born in Mexico City, but I moved to Chicago when I was like five years old. And I grew up mostly on the south side. Like I've lived everywhere, like Pilsen, Pilsen. Little Italy, Little Village. Nice. I lived in Wrigleyville for a year. Like So I am curious because Chicago is a big theater town and you uh-huh. sort of like just went through every, at, anywhere you could at every level and just like worked yeah. your way through the town. So I am curious about like your theater experience here. Like how would you describe like Chicago theater and like your experience? Look, if I would have told you in 2010, I would have answered something else. But now I look back with rose colored glasses and it was so formative when I, I, I think on Twitter, I had said like on my bio grew up in Chicago theater, but it did feel like that, like showing up at 21, 22, like, and starting a theater company, not knowing what the fuck I was doing. But that was that town, that town se presta. It lends mm-hmm. itself to starting a storefront. And I started, um, so when I got there and I was like classically trained and I thought I was going to be doing Shakespeare because I should have Shakespeare and there's a Goodman and Steppenwolf. I mean, I moved because of Steppenwolf because uh, somebody brought back some brochure with a big red S and it was like Steppenwolf and we saw the brochure. And I was like, I could just go and start my theater company there, you know, but um. It's funny that later on I went to well, on to work there, but um, I got I get there and I start auditioning. And now, mind you, this was a while ago. Right now, we have a little bit, a tiny bit more access than then. Um, but like the roles that we were getting in Chicago were not like there was not nothing shooting in Chicago then. You know, it was like maids with no lines or one line. You know, like it was just really sad that I was like, what is happening? Like I'm classically trained. And I came to this like theater town, and even in the theater, it was like not that. You know not very inclusive and I so I started a theater company uh, called Teatro Luna comprised of all Latinas back then we were calling um pa, pa, pan Latina Hispanas just because not everyone uh, identified as uh, as Latina or you know some people are identified as Hispanic the Miami Cuban did not even want to it's like I am I am Cubana I am not Latina and I was like okay so do we put the Cuban like dash Cuban to like well how do we name this company it was but it was such a good conversation to be like why are you resisting the term? Because it's a construct. Okay. So is being Cuban from Miami? Like what, 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 all identity is a construct. So, but, so what those conversations were so interesting that we put them on stage. And also because we couldn't afford royalty to pay royalties to a playwright and to pay a director, we started writing our own stuff about those conversations, you know, especially because, well, that Miami Cuban was like super white and, and blonde. And then we had Afro Latinas in there. I have mestizas, I identify as mestiza, you know, and it was like, what is this? Like, what, what is this umbrella that we're under? So we, every, all our explorations, we started putting on stage. So like the first show we, we made were, uh, was, um, uh, generic Latina because we kept having to go to these auditions and they would ask us to do these <sighs> accents. Can you just do a generic Latino? And it's like, what is it? Taco Bell dog? He's not even Latino, you know, like what the guy doing that voice, the original one. Um, it was like that kind of thing. So like, and it was great to explore. And then we did these, um, this, the second show, I think was like the Maria Chronicles, because all the roles we were going for were named Maria, you know, and it was always like, yes, Mr. Johnson, like, that's basically what was needed of us. So we wrote a piece, like, we wrote a piece about it, you know, and it went well. And then we started touring to like colleges, festivals. So like, we started getting a little bit of a name. We had a theater in Pilsen on 18th and Canal. Like, it all just started like happening, but still, we couldn't eat, you know, like, like, we had to like, because it's Chicago, you know? So I was doing voiceover. That was my favorite thing I've ever done, actually, even more than writing and act, like just being in the booth and being able like, so I was the voice. By the time that I, I came over here, I had, for 10 years, I was the voice of Walgreens. So you probably heard me every time you went to the store. The commercials and the, Esta semana en Walgreens, usted puede comprar papel higiénico por dos noventa y nueve. En el catálogo Easy Saver the Walgreens. Yeah, I was like the for ten years. The voice is Walgreens, and then I was also the voice of Special K. Con Special K, te puedes ver y sentir como tú quieras. For ten years, so I was feeding myself doing that shit, you know. And also, I was still acting for a while, so I was like in like Luis Alfaro play at the Goodman. Uh, I played in a, a version of uh, Romeo and Juliet. You know, I played the nurse, and, but like it was like. Spanish or Marine Julie. It was really hard because it's really hard to scan. Like homeboy scanned, well, whatever. I do have to say something. I want to say it because I like I didn't know what I was gonna do when I got to Chicago and it was so cold. I wasn't prepared for how cold it was. I, I accept the cold, but I wasn't prepared. I thought no one Boston. Ever is. I yeah. thought Boston had no. prepared me. So I didn't want to go outside to work. And this was way back in the day. And I became a phone sex operator for a few months. And I was 
the best. I was the most requested girl on nastyphonesex.com and we wrote a play about it. I mean, I wrote a solo about it and then later on we put, it was called SCXO and that was the most traveled like play that we put up because it was a crazy experience and I had a lot of notes for these men, you know, and I was like, let me work it out on stage, you know, and, and back that industry is dead. You know, there's no more. Now it's like webcams, but like you could be anonymous and just be an actor. I was so committed to my roles. I had two roles, Tabby. And she was like in the, like, like, like she was like 18 and she's like, talk like this, you know, and then Carla, the Hispanic vixen, but they didn't want a real accent. They wanted this kind of accent. Like I could do a real accent, but no, that, and it was very interesting who the men who called that. Anyway, I wrote a solo about it, toured it for five years like that, you know, um, and it was, it was really empowering to be in my theater company and not to be told no or you can't do a comedy about abortion you can't talk about being a phone sex operator sucia yes you can we could yes and you know like the 10 of us were learning how to be storytellers but we're all like not us like not the storytellers like we we're like it comes so uh, easily to us we just have to figure out the format you know first we started with monologues and little sketches and like it grew you know um, till we were putting music, like we got together with a, a composer, like, um, we did this, oh, one of my favorite things we did was called Machos. We interviewed a hundred men around the country, mostly Latinas, but Latinos. Um, but I think some, um, that I identified as, well, anyway, we performed as men that from verbatim, sort of from their interviews. And it was so interesting. The interviews were interesting because we found out, oh my God, we, people don't ask men how are you? And listen a lot. And then they have to answer, you know, uh, there were 36 questions in this questionnaire and um, around the end of like, we talked a lot about their moms. Oh my God. Latino men love their moms. Right. We got to the dad part. And um, we, one of the questions is, and, and, and I did it about 18 times uh, the interview. And I'm say 16 times the guy started crying when I said, do you think your father's proud of you? By the time we've gone through like all this stuff in tears, I don't, my dad, could, my dad could never do whatever it was. It was amazing. And it was like, fuck. So like we dramatized all that, you know, and that was one of my favorite things. And then we also did um, something where I was like, I, I'm a fucking director. I love directing because I was directing a lot of them, you know, um, Lunaticas, where we did this thing. And that's when I was like, I really like this directing thing. I wrote, directed and was in a play that I wrote myself called Enfrascada, which is now, it's, it is not Brujas yet because we haven't made it yet but like it's going to be brujas this, this series that i'm working on and it's so funny because like the work for this started in 2006 2007 mounted it did it and now it's like taking a whole new different life but that's that was chicago for me it was so like fertile and then i left acting because i was like okay where am I? like <laughs> like i was still fat and you have to like uh, go for these roles that were so, more and more offensive to me you know so i was like i want to write the role. i also I think acting is like an interpretive art form, just like um, directing, editing. But I, I like a creative art form. Like I want to mm -hmm. be the creator. And that was like, you know, so that's sort of why I'm, I'm here. But Chicago was great. Um, then, you know, they started noticing that I was writing a lot of the plays and directing. So like Goodman, Steppenwolf, they started giving me commissions. And then all of a sudden I was a playwright, like a, a legit playwright. Then like Oregon Shakespeare came calling the public theater. Like, I, and I was like, oh, shit. Now I'm a playwright. There's no time to run this company um, that was, you know, non for profits are hard, but like 10 years I ran it. And and um, it's so funny, like our operating budget was something like 150K, which is like our wig budget or something. I <laughs> like the show. We don't even have that many wigs, but like it, 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 it's crazy. But I was so proud when we got into that and we had like two funded positions, you know, like it was like my pride, you know, my joy, but like it was tough you know, being a non for profit. So I was doing a play in, I was doing a Frascada actually in, um, in New York and the New York times came to review it and all that stuff. And that's when like an agent, um, like a TV agent contacted me and I kept calling, I kept calling the, someone from Uta, it wants to like sit down with me. Um, and Uta me, me, va, me va a llevar a comer, a almorzar. So like calling Uta for weeks and no one corrected me. There's no period on the thing. It's it yeah. says Uta. It doesn't say UTA. It says Uta. You know. Well, in Chicago, there's no like uh you know. And I was I didn't have I was one of the first not Tracy Lutz, but I was like one of the first to um 
leave and start doing TV and then all my fr- friends started going. So I didn't have a model to be like, who the fuck is Uta, you know? But we sat down and he, you know, this agent who's my darling agent now, um, we've survived everything we've survived, including those 15 months we were not together. He was like, you know, I got a hold of this Malayerba play. He hadn't, he hadn't seen Enfrascada yet, but like, I think you can write for TV. And I was like, seriously, I was like, oh, people do that? I didn't know that was a thing, you know, like, I didn't pay, I was so myopic and like, I'm in the theater. Like, I wasn't paying attention to TV. I was, I was like, what do I have to do? Come out and take meetings, you know? And I was like, that's, that's it? I don't have to like go back to school for it or no. Okay. Which is probably the wrong advice he gave me because when I showed up, I didn't even know how to use Final Draft. I didn't know what an outline was. I didn't know what pitching was, you know. But um, I show up um, because I had a play, El Nogalar, at the Fountain Theater, a little tiny theater on Fountain. Um, I was like, well, I'll come. I'll take these general meetings or whatever that you're talking about when I come for the rehearsals. And so that's how it happened. And then TVS Maids happened. And then here we are. And, you know, you mentioned sort of like you didn't know about Final Draft and, you know, oh. UTA or anything. But I am curious of like those first like couple of years starting out, like what's the stuff you didn't even know you didn't know, like about TV, about the industry of stuff that if you were talking to your younger self, you're like, no one's going to tell you this, but this is like stuff you should know. Okay. So like just logistic stuff, Tim, my freaking agent didn't tell me that when you go to ABC for like a general, you should read what they're the pilots. I show up and they're like, so what pilots do you like? And I was like, what are you talking about? Like, I, I mean, I, Meti la pata, like to the max, because I didn't know, like he didn't, he, so when I was like, Hey, I call him, I was supposed to read pilot. Yeah. I thought you knew that. Okay. Tim, when I said, I know nothing about this, you have to really, and he wasn't my manager. That's what your manager does, you know, strategize and like tell the, he was my agent and he was not about to hold my hand. And I was like, you need to hold, my, like I demanded the love that I required. <laughs> I need hand holding, talking, talking down from the left. Like I need, so pobrecito Tim, now he has to let, he knows. He showed up in my backyard with mezcal and he's like, to, now he knows. Que soy super emocional and sensible and bien sentida. So all the legit, also like, I know how to talk, but I don't know how to frame myself and, and make you think that like, oh, I am going to like bring this to the, I show up and I'm like, ah, I, I, I was really bad at like, okay, so this is a thriller. I'm going to show you how good I'd be at the thriller. I brought the same story about my dad's mistress to every, to a thriller, to a whatever, you know, and that's probably not what you should do <laughs> because that's not what I want when I'm interviewing people. I want to know how, like, how you're going to work in my room, not just you in general, like, you know, but I was terrible. I, I was either great, great and genius at the meetings or just terrible, meaning there was no design and no one talked me through. I, and then the politics of the room, I entered a really traditional room. Like when it comes to the, who talks the upper levels talk and all that they're not so much like that anymore I, at least i don't hold my room like that um but i didn't know that either that as a st- not even a staff writer i was a diversity hire on devious mates and when i entered glow was in there gloria galon kellett ended up being you know she was in it but she was having a baby and then she came later but when i first entered that and i tell this story a lot and i'm going to tell it again but the first hour that they give us our offices because oh my god they're going to give us offices like even when I taught at DePaul, I didn't, um, cause it was like a tenure thing. I didn't get an office. It's amazing. You know, um, I, we were going to get our offices and, and we, we've cleared it up now. Like we, we've talked about it, but he turned around and he, you know, he says to me, you do know you're the diversity hire, right? And I never heard that term. I mean, why would I in the theater, you know? And I go, what's that? And he goes, Oh, honey, that, Oh, honey, that fucking, Oh, honey. I called the Uta guy and I'm like, Uta what the fuck is the diversity hire? And he's like, oh, I didn't want to tell you. So it didn't get in your head. Wait, why? 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 Why the assistant? Like, what? 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 What is the diversity hire? You just don't cough the show anything. So what I heard is you have no value. And that, I mean, that did prove to be that. I didn't have much value except sometimes like for cultural, ethnic, like confirmation of stuff, you know? Um, and also I didn't know pitching, you know? Anyway, so that like the politics of the room when you are... BIPOC, you know, it, 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 they can be harrowing, you know, and, 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 and traumatizing. I wanted to quit every fucking week. Like I would call the Uta, like just, I want to go home to starve in Chicago because, you know, I owed five months of rent actually. Oh, I had such a great landlord. Thank God he waited for me. Um, but I, I, and I lived in, um, Roscoe Village 
Um, mm. Damon and Belmont around there. Um, for the whole 16 years that I lived in Chicago, loved that neighborhood, you know? And I love my landlord because he, he waited for five months, you know? And what they don't tell you in this industry is that this is a rich person's industry. They, I started working August 9th. I didn't get paid till the end of October. I had to stay. Uh huh. That's when I first got my check from ABC, Disney, or whoever the fuck was paying me. Like, um, whew, that was rough. I was staying with friends. I did, couldn't afford an apartment, you know? My darling friend, Rondi Reed, who was an original ensemble member at Steppenwolf Theater. She's like, got, has a Tony for Aga Sausage County, like that play, you know? She happened to live in the valley because she was, she's, uh, Mike's mom and Mike and Molly was Mike's mom and Mike and Molly. And she had a, you know, house in the valley. So she let me stay in one of her rooms and, you know, and fed me every night. I mean, that's what they don't tell you. And then, you know, when you show up, um, listen, I was on the cover of Time Out Chicago, but I couldn't pay my rent. That's the theater. <laughs> you know, girl, I got review. I have my, the Chicago Tribune reviewed me five, whatever stars, you know, can't pay my rent. I can't buy groceries like that. That's the theater, you know? That's the difference. And I mean, this storytelling, when you do get in and start making some money, that's why it's like these golden handcuffs, you know, because you're like, oh, fuck, I hate the show. Sometimes I don't want to be in the show, man. But what I make weekly was like what I made in a one whole run of a play, you know? Oh, and then the politics of like who who you can be in the room and everything is political that those rooms are so exhausting, you know, and I can say it now because Glow said it a couple of years ago. We were on a panel. And she said it. But um. You know, there was a big joke that went around and uh, when she came, like, oh, when she came, everything was so much better. But she had drank the Kool-Aid and I, we had to like, like purge her from that Kool-Aid. I was like, you don't have to take this shit. No, cause like, you know, they didn't let her, she had just had a baby six weeks before and they didn't like her going to a uh, breast pump. So she had to pump in the room twice a day. That's illegal, you know? And she kept pitching and being so funny. And as, she, as the pumps were going, what the fuck, you know? And I told her, you don't, that's not normal. You TV people. I was like, you can't put up with that. Like, but it was like 2013. So like it, you know, uh, hopefully some things have changed, but she had normalized that kind of weird, like no agency, no right. But she was thriving. She was upper level. She was like, you know, but I'm like, if that's what it takes, go, I don't want to stay in this thing, you know? You gotta like be more politicized. I thought they, and there was a joke that developed that they would call us the showrunner and the room laughed every time they call us spick and span. That happened in 2013. They call us spick and span. I was like, come on, spick and span. And even glow would be like, um, she, like we cried about it already, but, but she was like, come on, I'll be spick. You can be span. Wait, glow. Don't play along with them. We would fight in the office in our office. And we're like, don't, we can't do that. Don't. Shuffle foot. That's not don't give them our power. You know, I want to go home to Chicago. This is some this is bullshit, you know, but it was so good for us because it formed our bond as sisters. And now our sisterhood is so strong and we do so much together. And it's like, we're changing things, you know, because of that, because of like, she had drank the Kool-Aid and I like snapped out of it. Take the blue pill. Like, come on. And then she was like, you, you want to make it in this thing? You got to do these things. And I was like, yes, sister, you know, so she was like that big sister that took me on her wing. And I was like, get woke. What the hell's wrong with you? Um, but, you know, but I understand now like, oh God, the shit. She was in comedy rooms. Those are traumatizing, you know, like all the shit she told me that she went through. I was like, you can't even talk about it in the podcast. You know, have you had her on? Not yet. Okay. She's a gold. Like she, yeah. she truly is golden. She's like the best we got, you know? Anyway, uh, cause she like went through the, the whole, like, being an assistant but like she did it the way that you think is the track you know like she did it that way I like skip some shit and that's why I'm so insecure but I'm also just insecure in my life but like I never think I know what I'm doing because I don't have a I never had a strong footing I still don't know how to work final draft very well I mean I know how to start typing but I don't know how to make shit happen put page number like I don't know how to do shit you know and people are like we'll teach I'm like yeah <laughs> <laughs> and uh, like my outline like I don't I never learned to do it so like sometimes oh, right now my pitch document looks like a poem of ellipses like and I'm sure the studio's gonna be like what wh why <laughs> because it's a script so I need to learn it like a like poem you know what the fuck you know anyway so um these are the things I didn't know I also didn't know that tv writing has very little to do with writing and it's a lot to do with talking 
who talks best, you know, pitching. I hated that. That first week I was like, I thought this was a writing thing. Yeah. But pitching. Pitching is, I'm a terrible pitcher. I never got good at it. So I'm still that playwright. They're like, can I just do it? Can I just show you? Mm, Let me show you yeah. what work, you know, which is not good. That's not a good way to, that's not a good way to run your show either. Um, anyway, um, those are things I didn't know. Yeah, and, and that so LA sucks. Sorry. <laughs> it's so lonely. So lonely here. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> and so, you know, how, how you sort of first got on my radar was I was watching an episode of Looking. And it was when, you know, Richie takes, um, I already forgot the other guy's name. Um, Patrick? Home. Yeah, Patrick. To, and I remember within the first five minutes, I literally paused the show, turned to the person next to me and was like, we have some Mexicans on this show. Mm -hmm. Like that is, it, the bell rang so clearly that I was, I was shocked. And I, I was and immediately, and then my second thought was like, oh, who, what consultants are they talking to? Because I'm like, it's never been this good. What's going on? And then I'm like going on IMDb. Oh, I'm like, I have to figure this out. And then the other time that happened was I was watching Viva and I saw a bottle of Valentina at the light talk. And I had never seen a bottle of Valentina on, the TV, on TV. And I saw it again, clear as a bell, like, like rung to like straight into my heart. I was like, oh, like, like what? What is, is this what it's like to be seen? Like, and just even oh. stuff like that. So I just wanted to say that because I'm like, that was, oh, that's amazing. And that's how starved I was for and didn't even know it. Like, you know what? There's, we have a deficiency, a cultural deficiency, and it's harmful. It's harmful to the culture because we have been consuming, sorry to get like a little polar, we've been consuming the Monsanto cultural version of ourselves, mm -hmm. helmed by other people's narratives of us, other people's point of view. You know how fucking toxic that is to consume the, their versions of you? Cause then you start to believe it because the, you, the, it's a mirage that they're your reflection, right? Oh, that's what, who I am. Fuck that. Like we have it. So, so you seeing Valentina is being seen and all, hopefully Vida was a bunch of moments like that because it was written by a bunch of Lat Latinas and half of them are queer, you know? Um, like for, for me, that was important. It was like a half queer show. Like, you know, one of the sisters was had that life, that path, you know? Yeah. Looking gave me permission because, um, I was also in that episode that you're talking about, mm -hmm. I think, um, like as an actor and which is the last time I was <laughs> in the episode of television. Um, because que hueva. But, um, that, like all the stuff on Twitter, the little memes that they form, cause she was really mean to Patrick that she was like, just she was not having him like you know and um all the stuff i got to say about white boys and all that you know more people sort of reflected that back to me than m my place and i was like whoa the power of tv so if i ever get a show the power of just the work like the, the 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 syntax the words you say you're right like like it, it um for her like she was the the head of that um of that mechanic shop like she would like all that even th that like was just it, it i i it gave me permission you know to be like put, put us out there like unapologetically because we have been so starved and you know what the dominant culture doesn't understand this that there's an alchemy that you just described to first seeing yourself to being seen that they've never had to experience mm -hmm. they've never because commercials from when they were kids even like like cartoon character they're all like like the dominant culture has never had to um, think of the, themselves of other eyes, you know, or, or been erased and we've yeah. been erased. So like Valentina to you means to you a lot. Like to me, bitty, bitty, bomb, bomb at the end of the first, it's everything. It's the most important because like that was code for us. That was even if, so for them, you know, for not non Latinas, uh, the, oh, there were two sisters dancing with their mom. That was the story. Fine. You're going to get that. But for us, that bitty bomb bomb was for us. And we, and it was like instant, you know, yeah. and, and across Latinidad, it's not just Mex Mexicans, you know? So uh, yeah, I know. I, I, I realized the power of that. That's why I'm so starved to get my second show. Cause like, come on. And you know, like Viva also had like the privilege, but also like the curse of like, it's the Latinx show. So it, it, it was going to be measured against everything. It was going to be compared to. So I'm just curious, like, what was your experience of, like, the expectations you had for what Vida could be and how you wanted to sort of, like, put it out into the world? And then what was the reaction that now you've created this thing in this room, all that next writers, and then it's out in the world? And, like, what, what were things you learned from that? that you, they don't teach you. They don't teach you, like, make a show, put it out there, and then the world gets to tell you what they think about it. 
you know, if you know me, I am bad at planning and designing a strategy. So none of this was strategized. It was all, it all, and that just happened because obviously you have to make it happen. But like, um, so I didn't pitch Vida. Marta Fernandez from Stars brought me in and was like, do you want to do this show? You know? And I was like, yes. And then here, all she wanted was a show about gentrification and my millennial females in East LA or Boyle Heights in that area. That That's what I got. And I was like, you got it. You had the queer and you got the family drama and you got, you know. And then to me, because like it was my theater company, I only worked and like, and, and in my show, like my, my, my theater shows, they're only directed by L- Latinas. Um, I try to, you know, like, so I just sort of imported my, my mission to this. And it just seemed like the most natural thing because Marta was not letting me know that it was weird or off or unusual. Like I would just be like, um, she was just yes ending everything. And I think that's the formula to have a, a, a like a, a champion and a gatekeeper that is like, understands the world the way you understand it, you know? So, cause like, I, I mean, my DP, as, as deep as that, my DP had never worked on a, uh, on a TV show in the first unit. She was second unit Narcos. She was this Afro Latina that had so much talent, but had never gotten that experience. And like, it's a big executive, big person to say, yes, you are responsible for this person. And I'm responsible for you because I'm making you a showrunner for the first time, you know? So like, it was like this, like, thing hand of sisterhood that was really po- empowering. And now Carmen Cabana, this DP is like so fancy and off and like, we've made a career, you know, which mm-hmm. is so fucking exciting. All those writers, those Vida writers, I mean, they just announced Santa Sierra who like has, a, you know, um, Margot, uh, um, Jen Gomez is doing infiltrators for Bloom. I mean, it, it, the, the superstars, right? They just sort of needed a nurturing environment, you know, to like that, not the writers, they were always going to make it, but, but, but they did get empowered, I think, by our like fraternity, you know, like, uh, it was sisterhood, but there, we had one cis male that I adore, um, Manda Alvarado, whom I know from, from the Valley, Rio Grande Valley, you know, you should interview him. He's great. Um, I've known him since the nineties. <laughs> uh, and he knows Raul too. And we, you know, have done theater together, but, um, but like I, there was no design, so I don't know. And now that it was out in the world, right now, if you ask me, all I mourn is that it's not currently out in the world. I mean, it, it exists in three seasons, but it's like, God, we had so much more to say. Um, and I owe it to us to say it. You know, I do take on that, which you shouldn't. Everyone's like, don't take, just make the art. But I'm like, hold on, it's a political statement to put brown bodies on a screen, and. Unfortunately, we don't get to do it that much. So, like, no, it it it, it does um it does have weight. What has life after Viva been like? What are you up to now? Like, what are you doing? So, I left Stars. I had an overall, um, a brown girl overall at Stars, and I got me a white man overall at UCP. <laughs> That's what Glow calls it. She's like, because she got a white man overall at Amazon, which is really a grown up overall. Meaning, like, I, they're they're funding my incubator. So, I want to talk about my incubator because I hope that people apply for it. It's in the form of a, a writer's group. So we're going to pick five writers to foment and nurture in a writing group. I call it workshop of my um, executive, um, Christine Davila doesn't like me to call it so much workshop, but I, you know, like a writer's group, writer's workshop where we like nurture and the safety, like cultural safety of us nurture five pilots, but they're going to get like, like WGA scale rates for, for development. Like it's real money. It's not like an honorarium. It's real money. It's a real development deal with them, you know? And that's so exciting, you know, cause, cause that's value. Like when I, when I didn't feel valued it, it, and it was tied to money is because they wasn't costing them. I, I do feel like if they're putting their, their, you know, their money where their mouth is, it's like we, we have, we have value. I hate that it has to be monetary, but it, it does to be respected and to be like, be like, you are voices. You five voices are the five voices that, you know, we're putting all this money into. So uh, the application process starts, I think, at the end of May. Um, we're still working on the web page and all that, but it's called uh, Ignition. My, th- my <laughs> theater company, my production company is called Ojala, and this is the Ojala Ignition Lab. And I do want it to be sort of like a lab where you, you know, a- explore. I And, and, and I, I try my best to keep you safe, you know, while you build this 
this thing and it's like sort of a new way of building um it's kind of a british way of building when people like make these little families um to build them um, content and then you know the uh you have kind of a uh it's kind of like a first look with it. like you come pitch it to us we read it we talk and if you know if, if ojalá and ucp feel like we want to continue it and do it we continue if not we say ve con dios and 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 um and we bless you and please get this made somewhere, you know? So I'm so excited about that. So that's like a thing that I'm so excited. Also for um, p um, support staff, uh, I, uh, I started with Mike Royce, um, this, um, uh, the access program where um, it's kind of like the showrunner training program, but for uh, uh, aspiring script coordinators and writer's assistants. And that is the ongoing, I mean, I know that this is, people play this all time, you know, but it's ongoing throughout the year. And right now we're taking applications for that pilot program so that's exciting so those are like things that I, you know and also you know i i um founded the uh, untitled latinx project and i'm sure you've talked to some of our badass chingona like shorner and and uh creators from from that list of 18 of us that sort of formed the society um that we of advocacy you know advocacy group and uh we we were the authors of that um letter that we opened letter to hollywood that Hopefully you signed or everybody, 272 people um, signed um, who are, you know, uh, TV writers. So that's like the, that, the stuff that gets me really excited. And then for my own stuff, um, I went to London for five months to run away from Rona, but also to write a pilot about Mexicans in London, sort of, you know, well, it's a love triangle. And um, between <laughs> these two Mexican girls and this um, British folk musician, what? The most like I don't know how British folk music discovered me during discovered me during um the pandemic, but it did. What? Like you don't understand. This is like the like you know, and I um I I I became like so into this musician, Johnny Flynn. I don't know if you saw the latest Emma, um, the Jane Austen. It's Emma, he was in the dig on and and Netflix and um he just played um David Bowie. Anyway, the fact that he was an actor wasn't the thing, it was his music. He's this amazing British folk musician, right? Just, oh my God, his stuff is so gorgeous, but like nothing like I would ever, you know, um, pay attention to. And I was like, I'm going to see if he wants to help me with this thing. And I just like zoomed with him. He said yes. And then he said yes to like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like, I don't even know what I was asking. I was like, I have this area, like, uh, you know, and I'm thinking of going to London. You should come here to Hackney, to Lord Clapton. You should come. And I was like, oh Yeah. Lurk clapped. Okay. And I got that day, I got an Airbnb in Lurk Clapton, got my plane tickets, and I went in for five months. And we worked on this beautiful thing called Love Song. And he's writing the music for it. And it's a dream. And, um, and he's like the whitest European, like Brit guy, British guy. And I, what I discovered is that my identity in London was, had no context. Like it was so interesting to strip me of people would meet me. I was like, oh, and they'd be like, I've been to Bogota. And you're like, yes. Okay. Or like, I love empanada. Like, there's no context for Mexicanness. The first time I got um, an Uber in London, the guy was like, so what language do you speak in Mexico? And I was like, neta? Like, seriously. In serio? You don't know? Oh, my God. Which is, I'm so aware of my identity here because, especially in the last administration, they had a very specific point of view of me. So you're always in your work and, and, and me every day sort of on the defensive about it. But when there's nothing to defend to, like, who are you? Who was I as a Mexican? It was really interesting. Like, um, the conversation I got into with Johnny, he just didn't, under, like, what do you mean? I'm like, oh, my God. You know, and it was great. And so put it in a pilot, you know. And then this thing that's been announced, and now I got back um, from Star, because it was at Stars, and now I got it back. Uh, brujas. I am a practitioner. I'm not a bruja myself, but I'm a practitioner of the belief system. And um, so I want to make an, uh, this Afro-Latina Chicago urban gorgeousness and just like kind of like decolonize magic um, and reclaim brujería for us and, and, and get it off that like that silhouette of the that Victorian silhouette, you know, that we're so used to and, and kind of like center it and how, you know, uh, since I was 11, I've, gone, I've been going to señoras and, and, and there are a lot of indigenous, like my señora in Chicago spoken Nahuatl to her kids you know she, wow. uh, yeah and her kid like that that's she was from Puebla and she was indigenous and you know not just identified she like spoke you know in her dialect and then most of the other señoras I went to over there were Afro Latina so um so that's super important to me to put on and and then there's something else it's an IP but I can't talk about it yet but it's 
partnering with a singer to produce it, but like a lat Latina singer from the United States. That's kind of fancy. Uh, and it's about, basically it's about quinceañeras, but, um, yeah, it's based off an IP. I get, I, nobody, nobody signed anything yet. So I can't really talk about yeah. it, but so those are the three things. And then I'm supervising, uh, stuff. Cause now that I have, ojalá, this company, it's like, oh, I'm, I'm also a producer, you know? And so, and, and, and that's, that's why ignition, the, the, the lab is so important because it's like a way to harness these, uh, new voices. Um, and, and I really encourage like, Journalists, documentary filmmakers, feature uh, writers, um, influencers, like other story uh, storytellers from other modalities to like come and, and apply because it we we're storytellers, you know. Um, and some of us have to discover that a little bit later in life. Yeah, and, and learn to use Final Draft. Please learn to use Final Draft. So I don't, <laughs> don't have to ask me. I'm always curious about people who do like who choose to be part of the work and the advocacy and you know all the stuff you're doing now and even like that Luna like. It, a lot of that is work. It's like, oh yeah, it's like so much work that no one is asking you to do. It's easier just to yeah. cash the checks and like chill. So I'm just curious, like, what what motivates you to do it? Like, why why do you feel so compelled to be part of that work? Compelled is the word. The word. You know, I, I I cannot not like I. Well, I told you how I was in high school, right? I had to like be involved in the the, the decision making of of, of of every you know. And then um, I got to Chicago and same thing, Caprona, and then I started um. The, the an alliance of all uh, you know Alta alliance of all Latina um, Latinx theater um, makers and um, I don't know it, ugh, <laughs> that's the answer yeah. sometimes I see how invisible we are but but that in the theater here as 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 uh, women identified persons you know like I, 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 it, it, I can't the injustice I mean the Sagittarius in me I can't I don't I don't know any other way. You know, and um, yet to my detriment sometimes, to the detriment of my work, do I dedicate? Because right now we're preparing a second action at the ULP and it's like, kind of just write the brujas thing. Like, just go sit down. No, but we must do this. You know, I don't know. I, 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 I don't know. Some people come with that like point of view, you know, and drive. And I don't, I don't have a good, I've never, because I've been asked this before and I don't have a good answer. It's just like, there is no other way. Yeah. Um, I, I would rot if it didn't if i didn't do something about stuff you know i don't know and and hope i will have more and more access to not use the word power and i can give more and more access because like i feel like that's what that's you know representation just it's so superficial just uh, to say representation like right now like i'm like an actor being you know latina in the show but we need access and opportunity that's like muscular representation you know behind the scenes and in the, so like i don't know if i can have some sway in that way, you know, have some, uh, and give some access. I, I, I don't have a good answer, but it, it, it can't, I, ugh. Yeah, that's <laughs> a good know? answer. Ugh. I always like to know who are the people that you're a fan of. So these could be heroes, peers, friends, people you creep on Instagram who don't know who you are, but you're obsessed with them. So who are some of the writers in your life right now? Oh, when you frame it like that, wait, <laughs> holy shit. Okay. Well, Right now, I'm a little obsessed with, um, this is so basic, what I'm going to say, Fever Waller Bridge and her sister, Isabel Waller Bridge, who's a composer and she's queer. And I, those two sisters, I'm like, how is there that much talent in one family, you know? Um, but, but Isabel, um, I hope I'm not too creepy. And, um, you know, Mae Martin, she did, uh, Feel Good. Oh, obsessed so much so that I bought a ticket for myself for October in Brighton, England. So I hope I'm back and I, I've never been to Brighton, this is the South and I'm gonna be going to see Mamar. I mean, I'm such a, like, not not stalker. Oh, come on, this is crazy to say stalker, but I'm just such a fan of me, you know? And uh, and I'm crazy about Michaela Cole right now. Like, they're, 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 I may destroy you, destroy me. Like, fuck, how do you tell a story like that? You are brave and gorgeous and a genius, you know? And um, so those those ladies, I'm obsessed with it. I'm also, um, Amara La Negra's, um, like weight loss right now and how people are reacting to it. I don't know if you're paying attention to that. Yeah. Um, uh, why are we reacting that way, you know, to weight loss? Like, do people are blocking her and like, what the, f it, like, feel betrayed? And it's like, um, it's an interesting thing about like, I feel like white women don't have to carry that, the weight of that. Like, when Rebel Wilson lost weight, she didn't. Why is I'm not have to anyway? Um, I think those are, but then I have different like obsessions back here, you know, like musicians and stuff that I get really into. 
And so where can people follow you on social media? Um, everywhere Tania Saracho. So like Tania Saracho, Twitter, Tania Saracho, Instagram. My Facebook, I never look at. I don't even know if I saw it. So don't. Right for the best. Right. I do ask my guests to help me title the episode of the, of the podcast. So the prompt is a blank Latinx writer. And you can put more than one word. You can mix them all around. You can change the words. Just whatever feels true to you the writing you do, this conversation. Um, I also use it as a recruitment tool so that when I post the title, someone will be like, oh, that's like me. Oh, that's like, like me, yeah. I should listen to this. this is I know, I've seen your can... things. And it's like, oh, Salvi, diggy, 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 diggy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I love it. Bueno, pues, I've come up with my own. <laughs> can I do it in my voiceover voice? Just kidding. <laughs> um, a constantly anxious and insecure yet still chingona Latinx writer. Or Latine. Let's start normalizing Latine, people. That is perfect. And with that, I want to thank you so much for being on the podcast. This is going to be such a treat for all the fans.